So I had to deal with all the problems in, in the region. And then, after two years, I told him, well, is it time for me to leave? He said, well, this would have been possible, but my chief of staff is leaving. So why don't you stay another few years as my chief of staff? One or two more years and so on. So I said, okay. And then, as a result of that, he said, well, we have a war on Iraq, you can't leave. And then we have a war on Gaza, you can't leave. You are from Sudan. Sudan is getting separated. The South is getting separated from the North. You can't leave now. There, was, there is a war on Lebanon. You can't leave. We're working on reconciliation in Iraq. We, you can't leave. And so on. So one year after another, and I stayed with him for his two terms, and I told him at the end, I'm very tired, I have to go. He said, well, we came together, we leave together. So I stayed with him almost for 10 years, and then after that, it was, there was also other complications. But I'll tell you maybe one or two stories about some of the things that I witnessed and I was part of, and I, 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 have, I can say that I'm proud to have been part of it. One of these stories is the story of the war in Gaza in 2008-2000. So the war started in December, and the Arab League foreign ministers met, and they decided to send a delegation to New York to go to the Security Council to try to stop the war. So it was around 10 foreign ministers and the Secretary General of the Arab League, and it was shared by the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia and the Secretary General with a number of other foreign ministers, the foreign minister of Egypt, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, and many others. And when they went there, they started negotiating on a resolution to try to reach a resolution to, to end the war. And once we arrived to New York, they told me, why don't you draft a resolution in cooperation with the Palestinian delegation to the UN so that we presented to the Security Council. And I did. So I sat with the Palestinian team in New York, and we drafted the resolution, and we presented it to the Security Council. And there was a meeting that took place between this delegation with three of the permanent members of the Security Council, the United States, France, and the UK. And the U.S. at that time, uh, the foreign minister, the Secretary of State, was Cordelia Chavez. Uh, the French foreign minister was Kushner. And the British foreign minister was David Miller. So they, these were the three negotiators on the Western side and the Arab side, and we started negotiating. So, it started by telling them, well, we want to draft a resolution to stop it. Condoleezza Rice said, no. No resolution. Uh, the maximum that you can think of is a draft statement by the Security Council first. No more than uh, and they agreed to meet the following day, and they said, we will prepare the statement. So, and we told them, no, we have a draft resolution. So we gave them the draft resolution, the following day they came with a draft statement to in the nation. So, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, the Secretary General, told them, no, as far as we're concerned, this is not acceptable. So we will go to the security council. And if you want to veto it, that's up to you. So the ambassador, the US ambassador or permanent representative to the UN, came to me and he told me, it looks like you want to veto. I told him as far as I am concerned, yes, I want to veto. So he told me, why do you want to veto? I told him, well, we prepared the draft resolution. That is, I think, is a good one. And from the attitude that I see from your Secretary of State and 
uh, you know, the, the negotiations that are ongoing. I don't think that this would work. You will weaken our visit. So I go back home, and everybody will criticize us that this resolution is weak. Why did you accept the weak resolution? But you veto my, my resolution and watch me when I go back. I was an official spokesman. I used to be on TV every single day in all kinds of outlets, and that gave you a very hard time. I'll say that we wanted to solve the war, and the US didn't want to stop it. So he told me, well, that makes sense. Let me go and talk to the Secretary of State and see what we do. So he went to the Secretary of State and told me, we need a few hours. We have to talk to the President. And so, so I told him, well, I can't give you a few hours. This is not my time to get. I have to go to my bosses. So I went to my bosses, and they told me, OK, this is what happened. And this is the discussion. And you decide. So they told me, OK, what do you think? I said, of course, we get them a few hours. If they want a few hours, we get them a few hours. Instead of going to the Security Council, we have to see what we can do. So they went, and they came back, and they said, OK, we agree. We will have a group that will be a drafting group to negotiate a draft Security Council resolution to stop the war. And we started negotiating, and what I expected happened. They weakened the resolution very, and diluted it very much. But then we agreed on the resolution. OK? After we agreed on the resolution, we said, OK, let's go to the Security Council. At that time, the President of Israel called the President of France, because France was the head of the Security Council at the time. And instructions came to the Foreign Minister to postpone the meeting of the Security Council for one day. in response to a request that not made by Israel. So they met again, the foreign ministers, with the Arab foreign ministers, and they told them we want to postpone the meeting for, for tomorrow. So the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia and the Secretary General told them, no. We will go today to the Security Council, and if you want to veto it, by all means, we will go back to our original resolution and you can read. So the French foreign minister said, well, the president gave me instructions and he's sleeping. So there's nothing that can be done. So the Secretary General told him, well, this is the time when presidents have to wake And we adjourned and we said, we will meet in the Security Council. You go and do what you want. And before the meeting of the Security Council, we come back to us and tell us what you said. And this is what we did. We went to the Security Council, and then when we came, they told us this is what we're going to do. France accepted that we will hold the meeting and that they will vote on the Security Council decision. And at that time, also from the Lisa Rice came because there were efforts for the US to withdraw its acceptance of the resolution. And she said, my deep apologies. I said that I accepted the resolution, but now I received instructions that I will not be able to accept it, but I will not be, I will abstain. And she did. And the resolution passed, and we were able to stop it. So this is one of, the, one of the stories. I have a similar story in relation to Lebanon. And also when the war in Lebanon started in 2006, we also went to the security office. But this was an even more interesting story. Because the Secretary General at the time, he was in Syria. And he called me on the phone, I was in Cairo. He told me, the Prime Minister of Lebanon called me, and he wants us to have 
a meeting of foreign ministers in Beirut at the time of the war. So the war was ongoing, and he said, this is what the prime minister wants. Can we do that? I said, well, give me a few hours. <laughs> I need to see what we can do. So I called the Egyptians and the Jordanians who had relations with Israel, and I told them, please call Israel and find out whether we can hold a meeting of foreign ministers during the war in Beirut. So they both went to Israel and asked them, can we do that? And the response came, yes, you can. But on one condition, that you will have to leave, all the ministers will have to leave before sunset. And we will have to arrange for, for this to take place. So I asked the Jordanians and I asked the Egyptians to prepare two planes, one from Cairo and one from Amman, to go to Beirut with the foreign ministers. And we agreed that around, the Arab League has 22 countries, so we agreed that around 10 to 11 would be coming from Cairo to Beirut, and another 10 to 11 would go from Amman to Jordan to Beirut. And the Secretary General came from Baikar, from Damascus to Beirut. As soon as he arrived, we met. He told me, OK, what are we going to do? I told him, well, we will go to the Security Council and try to stop the war. So he said, OK. And when the ministers came, while they were gathering, they started discussing. And he told me, and then he started opening this, the issue. And he said, OK, this is what we are suggesting. And the foreign ministers agreed that the delegation would go from Beirut to New York in order to do so. So he told me, OK, prepare yourself for good. I said, OK. Once we go to Cairo, we can do that. He said, no. We're going, we're going from Beirut to New York directly. I told him, no, I can't do that. You have your luggage and you have your clothes. I came just like this, you know, because I knew that we had to depart. All what I had was my briefcase with my papers. So he said, this is your problem, not mine. And we have to go to New York. So we took off from Beirut to France, and then from France to another plane to uh, New York. And we negotiated, and who knows John Button? Anybody? John Button, he was the National Security Advisor of President Trump, and he was the permanent representative of the US during that war. So we went and we met with him, and he also said, no resolution. We don't want a resolution. The war can continue. And it took maybe 10 days of negotiations until we reached a resolution that stopped the war. In the I'll stop here because I have a ton of, ton of these stories. But, uh, but let's go to other questions. What made you kind of want to be in this type of job and like go to other countries and negotiate their resolutions on issues? It's fascinating. <laughs> it's a very interesting job. Uh, you face all kinds of difficulties. You try to do all kinds of things. You fail many times. By the way, the stories that I told you, uh, perhaps I have maybe one or two additional stories of success, but for the most part, they were failures. So those who want to work on issues of that nature have to be prepared to accept failures more than they accept successes, because the possibility of failure is much higher than the possibility of success in diplomacy, and this is you know, what you see around the world. When you look to the situation in Yemen, the situation in Libya, the situation in Syria, the situation in Sudan that you discussed, and so on, um, war goes on, the conflict goes on. Uh, Ukraine, 
you know. So, so the successes are very few and far apart. But when they happen, they are worth it. So this is why I think it's one of the most interesting jobs in the world. And Ambassador, did you start your career on this track, or did you perhaps start somewhere else? No, I started as a teacher in Cairo University after I graduated. I graduated from, uh, I was, my major was physics at the time. So I'm originally a physicist, and after that, I taught for a few years. And then, and then I decided that I wanted to be sometimes in Egypt and sometimes in different places around the world. So I entered the exam for the Foreign Service, and I passed, and I enjoyed every single moment since then, until I retired. And now I'm working in a similar area, in areas of peace building, conflict resolution, trying to see how these conflicts can be approached in a manner that would allow um, people to live in peace if, if this is at all possible. Any other questions? So who put all these questions on the table? Okay. several times uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, when I went to Iraq at one point in time, we were targeted with missiles while we were there, and so on. So yes, it is, sometimes it is threatening, sometimes it is dangerous, but it is also extremely exciting. So, you know, it depends on your tolerance, level of tolerance to danger. In our parts of the world, our threshold is very high in relation to danger because we're used to it. In many other places around the world, so for, for example, in many, other, in many places where we had offices and where we used to visit and so on, uh, the UN would come to us and tell us, well, we can't go because they are preventing us as a result of security. Uh, so uh, can you report to us what you intend to do and what people are telling you there and so on. And we say, okay, we'll do that. And as a matter of fact, sometimes this happened with Western countries, including the US, Europeans and others, and said, say, okay, you were in Iraq, or you were in Somalia, or you were in Lebanon, or in Sudan, or in Darfur, and we, we can't go there for security situation. What is this situation like? What did you see? What did Mr. tell you? And so on. So as a result of the fact that our tolerance is much higher, so we are able to, to do more things than um, many others. Uh, in Somalia, for example, when I was working at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, we had an office in Somalia, where at the time when all the UN agencies were working from Kenya, because, because the security situation was uh, prevented them from being there. So, so this, this is, this is how the situation is, and this is how we try, we try to help different people in conflict areas. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, how has all your experiences and different people shaped you today? Well, one of the reasons why I was asked by USIP to be a senior fellow is because of my experience. So they, they approached me after I was retiring, and I knew a few people there that when we met in conferences and so on, and they got to know me, and as a result, they told me, would you want to come to, as a senior fellow at USIP for one year? I said, okay. And when I came, I stayed there for one year, and then after that they said, okay, let's have another year. I said, okay. And then let's have another year. I said, okay. Uh, so now I'm in my final year because I have a visa that allows me to stay only for five years. Um, I was lucky in my life because I haven't 
ever try to find a job. As when I graduated from college, they appointed me in, in the university, and then I entered an exam. I worked in business for a few, for two years with friends. Uh, also, didn't ask for a job, and then I entered into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then the Secretary General of the, of the Arab League took me with him to the Arab League, and then I went to the OIC as a nomination from Egypt, and then I was elected. So I never looked for a job. I was very lucky. You know, not that many people in the world have, are lucky in, in that respect. But when I was retired, I wanted to look for a job. Because I didn't want to retire and sit at home. And I, I will not do that. So after I finish with USIP, I'll be looking for another opportunity to do something else. But I didn't know how to do so, because I haven't done it throughout my life. So, so as a result of this experience, I was lucky enough to get this project. And perhaps, uh, hopefully, I'll get something else when I complete my work at USF. So now that this is your final year, will you go back to Egypt? Uh, either go back to Egypt or depending on where I find an opportunity. Okay. If I find an opportunity elsewhere, perhaps somewhere in Europe or maybe elsewhere, I, I'm, I'll be willing to do so. So I think I think Europe would be an interesting proposition at this point. Europe? Yes, I hope so. Working also on things. It's interesting to see how Europe is evolving and what kind of role they are playing and they intend to play as a result of all kinds of changes in the world. Because one of the outcomes of the war in Ukraine made them realize how much they are dependent on energy coming from outside and that they need to see what can be done in order to secure energy in a manner that would be beneficial to them. So their reliance on oil and gas from Russia was too high a level of, of dependence. And of course, they are trying to see now how they can switch to renewable energy. Uh, but this would be a long-term proposition until 2050. So there is a long time. So what are they going to do in the, in the, in the meantime? One of the developments that took place is that they were trying to see whether they can get rely more on energy coming from different places around the Middle East instead of Russia. So including Algeria, including Qatar, including Egypt and Israel, and so on. And they have done a number of agreements in relation to trying to see how this can be secured. So Europe will be looking to the Middle East in a different way as a result of all kinds of developments and as a result of the fact that they feel that this is their neighborhood. And they do have what they call the neighborhood policy that deals with the regions and countries that surround the European Union in order to see how this, this cooperation between the EU and the different countries around Europe can be advanced to help their interests. So that would be my, my, my hope. Anybody else? All the questions are coming from right, right over here. Yes. Um, what has been the most difficult place that you've had to travel to, and how have you dealt with the conflict there? I know. <laughs> what has been the most difficult place you've had to travel to, and how have you dealt with the conflict? Uh, well, sometimes it was conflict and sometimes it was humanitarian issues. Because when I worked at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, my focus was on humanitarian assistance. But they are still dangerous places, whether they are in conflict or uh, needing humanitarian assistance. So the most dangerous places that I've been to have been Somalia, and I went to Somalia maybe five times uh, in five years when I was at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And a few times immediately after I left, uh, the places where we stayed were bombed by, 
al-Shabaab, a terrorist organization in Somalia. Uh, in Iraq, I told you we went there and we were attacked by rockets. So this also happened. Uh, Afghanistan was also dangerous. And with USIP a few months back, I was in Libya, both in the east and in the west of Libya, to try to see what can be done and all kinds of things, uh, including helping uh, Libyan diplomats uh, in their training and in trying to see how they can advance their abilities. So, so I went to some dangerous places, but they are always fascinating places to go to. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you have to have a tolerance to danger and be willing to, to take some risks. Not necessarily crazy risks. I don't go to places where people are fighting and having the exchange of military attacks and so on and say, well, uh, everything will be fine. No, we are careful. We try to be as careful as we can. But still, this doesn't mean that these places are not dangerous. No, they are. And sometimes they are quite difficult, but it's, a, it's a still a very rewarding job. Sometimes it's also painful, especially the part on the humanitarian side. When you go to different uh, refugee camps, uh, I went to refugee camps in Syria, refugee camps in Turkey, in Jordan, in, I went to uh, refugee camps in or displaced persons camp in Chad, in South Sudan, in Kenya, in Ethiopia. So I've been around and I've seen lots of people suffering, and trying to help them is extremely rewarding. Sometimes it's frustrating because you go back to those that are supposed to help, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So it becomes frustrating, but this is part of the of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, to try to see whether you can help these people in a more effective way. Go ahead. Uh, with regards to the Syrian refugees, uh, what do you think are the impacts of colonization in the Arab world? There was a similar question that I was asked last night about that. Um, to see. Countries can have all kinds of excuses for not doing that. You know, we were colonized. Yes, of course you were. At one point in time or another, Egypt, for example, was colonized by almost everybody. Why? Because it has a strategic location, and it was the big, always the big prize. Whether it was from the French, the British, the Ottomans, you name it, everybody came to Egypt. Okay. So we can say, well, we were colonized for many years and decades and centuries and so on, and we're not doing good because we are colonized. Sure. If you want an excuse, you can find it. But, but also you can see that there are many countries around the world that have done well after they, the colonization. So Egypt has had a, a, a change. Um, they got rid of colonization in, in, you know, at different stages, but, but we've, been, we've been capable of governing ourselves at least for the last 70 years. And 70 years are enough for you to overcome any difficulties that were associated with colonization. Uh, so I don't see this as a good issue. We can do much better in different places around the world that are saying, well, we are colonized. Sure, yes, of course. But then, but then you can do much more than that. I'm, I see that you are looking forward to your holidays. <laughs> and you have had a long year, it seems. OK, anybody else? Go ahead. Um, how is the tension between Israel and other Arab countries uh, different when Israel was first formed and today? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. There has been a lot of change since Israel was established 75 years ago. They were celebrating 75 years in the last few weeks. 
And during this period, uh, a lot has changed. And the biggest change was the result of an initiative that came from Egypt. In 1977, when President Sadat decided to go to Jerusalem, he said, I'm willing to do anything on earth to achieve peace and to get back my land because we had land that was occupied as a result of the 1967 war. And then we entered into another war in 1973 to liberate our land. And we liberated part of it. But then this was the whole point, is to try to, to, to send the message that we will need to go to war to, to liberate our land. And we decided to go to Jerusalem. And since then, we achieved peace in 1979, a peace agreement between Egypt and Israel as a matter of fact, with the help of the United States, and without the help of the United States, it might not have been achieved. So this is also in recognition of the role that is played by the United States in resolving conflicts around the world. And this conflict was crucial. And then as a result of that, there were additional developments. One of them was reaching a peace agreement between Jordan and Israel and also reaching an interim agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis in Oslo. That was also signed in the White House. So as a result of these developments, things have changed. Past, you know, press forward a few years after that, and then only a few years back, during the Trump administration, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan decided to normalize relations with Israel. So there has been a change, a huge change. But then, one of the difficulties that we're facing in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that there is a huge asymmetry of power between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Israelis are extremely strong, and the Palestinians are extremely weak. And as a result of this weakness, there there were efforts to compensate this weakness through offers coming from other parties, including the United States, by offering, for example, holding an international conference that took place in Madrid in 1991, very famous conference, the Madrid Peace Process Conference, that started a process of negotiations, and then it failed. And then there were other attempts. So there are always attempts by other parties, including the Arab world, to say to Israel, OK, if you achieve peace, and this was in the context of an Arab peace initiative that was adopted in a summit that took place in Beirut in 2002, giving Israel an offer, saying if, there, if peace is achieved between the Israelis and the Palestinians, we will be committed to establishing relations between all of us and Israel. This was also adopted later on by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation by all Islamic countries, 57 of them. So saying that if peace is achieved, all these 57 countries will establish normal relations with Israel. To try to see how they can compensate the weakness of the Palestinians by giving Israel an incentive to advance to achieve this. But so far, we haven't succeeded. And, and this is one of the areas that I'm focused on more than many others. And it is sad to say that the prospects of advancing peace on this issue is not that high. Unfortunate as this may be. Go ahead. Uh, you said that the U.S. had a role in the in conflict resolution as well as the conflicts around the world. Why do you think that is that there's so they have a large overreach of the whole world? Why does the U.S. have an overreach in the world? Yeah, 
Yeah, and like conflict resolution as well as conflict. Well, the U.S. is the superpower of the world. And it has interests and influence in the four corners of the world. And as a result of the U.S. willing to go for, it, at that time, it was the sole superpower of the world. Uh, also, it is capable of providing incentives to conflicting parties in a manner that would allow them to make concessions. So this is why the U.S. has this uh, Also, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. But then, but then, this is also related to efforts by getting to peace. Um, but mind you, one of the interesting developments that took place only recently was a big success story when the United States mediated an agreement between Lebanon and Israel on maritime borders, despite the fact that the two countries continue to be in a state of war between each other. And this was historic. Why? Because the United States was able to separate one dimension of a big conflict and say, OK, there are resources in the Mediterranean that you are both interested in. And if you reach an agreement to delimit your maritime borders, you can both excavate for oil and gas, and this would be beneficial for both. So there was a win-win situation that the US was capable of achieving, and as a result, a historic agreement was reached between Lebanon and Israel only recently uh, by uh, a, a very capable Negotiate, American negotiator called Amos Hofstein. One last question. Uh, so during these high state negotiations, do you ever think that humor plays an important role in progressing the conversation forward? So bringing some sense of levity to the conversation. Well, not necessarily humor, but, uh, but it depends on the context of the country. So for us in the Middle East, for people to have a meal together, that is a great thing. So when we were working, so that's another story about some of the things that I have done or participated in. We were working on reconciliation in Iraq. And it took almost two years to convince the different Iraqi political forces to accept the role of the Arab League in reconciliation. There were three main components. The Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds. And as a result of the war on Iraq, the Shiites that were not getting their share of power became the dominant force. So they thought, well, if the Arab League intervenes, then who would they put pressure on? They would put pressure on us because we have the biggest share of the pie, so we don't want them to participate. Interestingly enough, the Sunnis as well said, we have good relations with the Arab League. And since we have good relations with the Arab League, who do you think they will put pressure on? They will put pressure on us because we have good relations. And then the Kurds said, well, we're Kurds. 
This is the Arab deal. So they will, they will sit, stand by the Arabs against the Kurds. Goes without saying. So it took us a year and a half to talk to them, all of them, and to go to Iraq many, many times to tell them, no, you are mistaken. We are, all what we aim for is to provide you with a platform to come and talk. We will not pressure anybody. We will help facilitate the process of dialogue in order to reach your consensus. And they agreed. So they came and they sat around the room. And people were accusing each other of very difficult things. One of them told another, you tried to kill me. So can you imagine the tension in the room in relation to a discussion when somebody tells another one, you tried to kill me. And these are political forces. But then, as a result of the fact that they sat together for days negotiating and discussing the future, rather than the past. The thing that affects them most were, was the fact that they were having meals together, breaking bread. The reconciliation did not succeed. But it wasn't a total failure. So when there were terrorist attacks in Iraq, these leaders came together and they were able to take a stand, all collectively, against terrorism, avoiding the civil war. So sometimes even failures have partial successes associated with this. Of course, if there is human that helps people come together, that would be good. But sometimes the level of tension and what's happening is extremely high to the extent that you would, what you, all what you hear hope for is that people would be civil to each other, that they would be able to talk about the issues and not you know, deal with these issues as personal issues, but also as uh, in the context of interests and also in the context of the future. Of course, the past is important, and how to deal with the past is one of the biggest problems that faces conflicts. OK, even if you agree on something, how are you going to deal with the grievances of the past? And this was the case, for example, in South Africa, about apartheid. OK, apartheid is gone. But then people were harmed, and they paid a very high price. So what do you do to achieve justice for these people? It is not that easy to forgive and forgive. But sometimes, this is what you have to do. And this is my alarm that tells you I need to go to the airport. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for being here. It was a pleasure talking to you. you know, Tim, I'll say something It's not supposed to be on the recording. I enjoy talking to the older guys, but I prefer the younger guys. So it was a pleasure to be here and to talk to all of you. I wish you a wonderful summer. Enjoy yourselves. And before coming back to school next year, and I wish you a very successful future. And if you decide to go to Peace Building, uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.